pleased to have at this table Suzanne O'Brien. Thank you so much for being here. You Thank are a nurse, an author, a doula. A doula. What is a doula? It's really an end of life doula. So let me explain. Doula is usually associated with the birthing of babies. If people know it, it's a Greek word that actually means non-medical person that gives physical, spiritual, and emotional support to someone else. And I've put it on the other way of end of life because my history as a nurse is in hospice and oncology. And I really felt that we were lacking that same support at the end of life as we do for bringing life in. So I created end of life doula program. So as an oncology nurse, yes. you saw some people die. Yes. We don't die well in this country, I think. We don't know how, first of all, we don't want to let go. We want to live forever, of yep. course. Yep. But you say as a doula giver, there is a way to die. Yes. What is the best way to die if you have time, if it's end of life and you've lived a rich life? Well, you hit on so many great points. And one of the biggest things is we're not even talking about death in our society, so let alone planning for it. So dying well is really how I would want to die myself. It's a subjective way of making a decision. Um, and thinking about what things mean as far as treatments and quality of life. And that's done by what's called an advanced directive ahead of time. So that's something really important. For me, if I was going to use an example, dying well would be probably the most natural end of life experience that I could possibly have, which means when my body says I'm no longer capable of being in this body to just go into a deep sleep and be comfortable. I'd like to be pain free. I'd like to have my dignity and go into that, let, that sleep state that goes into the afterlife, so to speak, or whatever, the body does die. As a doula giver, do you work hand in hand with hospice? We are an adjunct to hospice. It's very interesting because in the very beginning, people would say, well, do I need hospice if I have a doula? And yes, you do, because remember that doula is a non-medical person. But for me as the hospice nurse, where this really organically was born is that I wasn't able to stay the duration of the time period that I wanted to with patients and families. So the doula comes in and can stay, where the hospice nurse manages the care. The loved ones do the care. And this is the big disconnect, I think, that's out there with hospice. It's such a wonderful end of life support, except for they manage the care. The family and loved ones are doing the care. If you give me a patient for seven days, how am I supposed to teach the family how to care for their loved one? And there's so much in end of life with unfinished conversations and what is important to the person, that it can't be done in five days at the end. Do you think people wait too late to call in hospice? They have said in a polls, about seven out of 10 people polled said they, they waited too late to call hospice. So yes, so to put it lightly, when, yes. When do you call hospice and thank heavens for hospice? Yes, thank Which was heaven. born in, in Connecticut. Yes, it was. Yes, so yes in, in Brantford. Yeah. So when do you call in hospice mm -hmm. for a loved one. My, my way that I say it is sooner rather than later, always. So if you're ever, can, like, is it time? Sooner rather than later. You can get on the program. It's usually from six months or less if you have a disease process where a doctor thinks that from six months to the end of that process, you would be at end of life. However, I've had people on for longer than that. But if there's any doubt in your mind, get on the program because when I with we have wonderful people that come in and it's such a fantastic program and you can always go off of it so again call them sooner rather than later but I think the most important thing is to have a discussion with your family and to say where you'd like to be in your last days and how that's going to be accomplished do you know what I mean and nine out of ten people say they want to be at home but if the family doesn't have the basic skills how are they supposed to care for that loved one? They're petrified. Death is the second leading fear in this country. And believe me, I've seen it. Trying to teach a family how to care for their loved one. And what happens is they're not present at the end, being present meaning in their mind and body. And it's not the way that end of life should go. Um, so that's why I give these free level one trainings. So you're a caring person, otherwise you would not be a nurse. Thank you. When did this come into your mind that you're going to teach people how to do end-of-life care. 
two weeks into my rotation in end of life, whether it was oncology or hospice, I said, we have a problem. And I think it was really the oncology because I had people that were facing end of life and that's where it wasn't even being discussed. And I said, wait, why in this little section where we're dealing with it? I understand that it's not, you know, we're not talking about it as a society, but why in this one area when we're facing it, are we not having more discussions about it and options? So I started writing my education pieces immediately, but it was that trip, and I don't know if you know this, that I went over to Africa to a country called Zimbabwe that had no resources. And I would go out with the hospice team and they didn't have what we have. What they were doing was taking a neighbor and training them to sit with the dying neighbor and their family and take care of them for the duration, like that birthing of that baby, without resources. So the knowledge and the power of just how the body shuts down naturally was so powerful in, in how that ending was that I said, I'm gonna go out there and do this. So you now are teaching doula givers. That's, that's yes. your trademark. Yes. What are you telling people and, and how are they receiving this? And are we gonna get better at dying we are. We in are. this country? And, and are there other countries that do it better than us? There are some, but it's really fascinating because in the last two weeks, I've gotten emails from three different countries that want to be part of doula givers. Level one is my free community global outreach. So I said, I'm gonna to put together a comprehensive program that teaches from when somebody gets a terminal diagnosis all the way to the end of life, how you care for them. And the goal is to teach people before somebody gets ill. So I'm not faced with that, oh, I only have five days or I don't have the time. This is a life skill that used to be handed down generation to generation. I'm not reinventing the wheel, I'm just bringing it back. And I think because of all my experience, I could put a really nice comprehensive program together. And I have to tell you, it's pretty inspiring and uplifting people say, how can you do that? There's some great stories involved in it. You're not with patients a lot, but you are somewhat with patients. Yes. What do you get from a patient who is dying, what, what have you learned over the years? It is the biggest privilege to be able to be with somebody at end of life, I will say that. But what I do get is a connection of something that's bigger than anything I've ever felt before. When you come in to assist somebody at that very fragile time in their family, there's this immediate bond because it doesn't matter how much money you have or how many degrees you have, human to human. And they also share a lot of their life's perspective. And they say that time is your most valuable commodity. They say, don't waste your time on things that people have told you, you know, doing. What is in your heart? What do you feel? Love, love deep, love your family, and don't waste your time, because I've had people from 106 to five be my patients. How has this changed you over the years? <sighs> Becomes really present in the moment, because we're not guaranteed anything, but it also connected me to, a a universe that's bigger than than I ever thought. You know, going over to Africa is one thing, but getting emails with people who want to be doula givers in this training from England, Canada, Australia, we're all connected. And also talking about how, you know, if we have resources in this country, that's fantastic, but there are people that have no resources. And in Zimbabwe, seven-year-old children were taking care of parents that were dying, and the average age of a woman is 42. At the end of life, what it taught me is that no matter what happened in our life, we all have the same needs and we're all basically the same no matter where we come from. So we need that support and we, need, we can do it well. That's the thing is that I saw, say I had seven patients, the one room might be a phenomenally beautiful experience, the other six, so I started studying the elements of what made that room better and wanting to teach that to people how they can have a positive, because like you said, we're all going to get there, so let's do the things and let's support one another. You know, let's not, not talk about this. People who are dying, what have they told you over the years about their lives? What, do, what have you learned? Biggest thing is regrets. Biggest thing is forgiveness. Biggest thing is how you spend your time. So there's something that organically happens and is quite beautiful about when they become closer to the time that they're leaving, they, they seem to get more of an enlightened perspective on what the life's journey was about. And there's all these aha moments for them and when they share it with me, but they will talk about 
forgiveness. And we all have it. There's this place in the training that's level two, in the middle level, this, this middle section. And I always, it's about forgiveness and it's about regrets. And there's not one person that I can say doesn't have forgiveness to give. And there's not one person that doesn't have forgiveness to receive. And that's transformative, especially when somebody's about to leave, for them to say, I love you, or I'm sorry, or whatever they want to do, um, or reconcile with somebody. But why not wait? Why do we have to wait till the end? Let's learn about that now. And learning from them. And I've actually interviewed some end-of-life people patients and they talk from those pals about the experience. So you see similar things in people that are ending their lives after a life lived in their 80s, their 90s, 70s, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Is there a sameness that you see with these patients and what can you tell us about that? What I can say is that what uh, surprised me is even different cultures and religions who you know have a certain way that they were living their life, it all came down to them talking about being connected to one thing, which is all of us, that we're all connected to this unconditional loving energy. And I'm just gonna share with you what they have shared with me. And they talk about sometimes experience it before they leave, maybe they'll see something or they'll just get sometimes this look of serenity and peace and they'll say, I understand now and I get it. And I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, it's all about learning. This whole journey was about learning lessons in life and that we're no different. In fact, we're connected. And that is extremely powerful to me, to understand that. Because I think right now we're thinking we're all separate. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do. Yeah. Do you think we're going to do better at this, be more giving toward the end? I mean, I, nobody wants to talk about death. Yeah. We all want to live forever. Yeah. And as you said, we wait till the end to get stuff done or to say things or to say I'm sorry or to say I love you. Are we going to get better at this as a culture? We are. And you know how we're going to get better? By just talking about end of life talks about life. So it's interesting because these workshops are, are amazing. People at the end of them are, feel so exhilarated because they feel so alive because we've really we've really pointed out the importance of what we're doing in our lives and, and how we don't want to wait and how we're learning from the end of life. And then the tools of empowerment on how I want to have my end of life be. I would love to be at home. I'd love to be surrounded by loved ones and pets and that to-do list. You know, if there's things that I want to do, but the most important thing is I really want to live in a present moment every day with whoever I'm with. And people dying have taught you that. Yes. Suzanne O'Brien, thanks so much for imparting all this information to us. Thank you. SuzanneO'Brien.com, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Spend all night kissing and a bottle dry right here, then who else is missing? Got a little sidetrack to find my solution and find a piece of the door, but it's also a metaphor. Need to keep locked in the grocery store of a mind. Just to save time.